Hey everybody, Dr. O here, and in this learning outcome, uh, USLO 2.6, we're going to be learning about the structure and the function of major molecules that are important to the body. So specifically, we're going to be learning about carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Now these are the, the big macromolecules that our bodies use in order to uh, make other things, whether that's a, a hormone or um, a protein or some sort of neurotransmitter of sorts or, or just any number of things. So this is what we're going to be working with. So within each one of these, we're going to be learning about how they are created and basically what they're doing for us. So let's get started. So it behooves us at this point to understand how these big molecules that we're going to be talking about are put together. And many um, of these big molecules are what we call polymers. And basically, poly means many. And polys are put together by monos, monomers. Mono means single or one. So what's an example of a polymer? Well, a glucose molecule. So this is a, a sugar ring, uh, a glucose molecule. And uh, many of our complex sugars are put together by knitting together these monomers. So for example, this is a molecule of glycogen, which is how our bodies store sugar. One of the ways we actually store sugar as sugar the way we store sugar as sugar. And uh, what we see here is that we have a glucose ring and a glucose ring and then a set of glucose rings that are branched off here and then a continuation of gluco rings, glucose rings right there. So we see monomer, 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 making up a polymer. So this is a perfect example of that. So we can um, make these in the body. In fact, I said we store glucose. Like I said, we store glucose as glycogen. And we synthesize glucose by way of dehydration reactions, which means that we're cleaving off um, this, hyd this uh, uh, hydrogen right here and this hydroxide over here on a different one, and we're putting them together end to end like that, as we can see, end to end, just like that. And that's a dehydration reaction. Now, when we get ready to utilize this glycogen, we're going to break it down through a hydrolysis reaction, which means we're going to come here, we're going to cleave this uh, this this uh, joint right here, joint this bond right here, and we're going to take a water molecule and we're going to patch it over. Let's just look at another example. Now, before I showed you an example of a of an amino acid. And I said you have a nitrogen over here at this end with a couple hydrogens and a carbon over here with this end that's bound to an oxygen and a hydroxide and a central carbon with some sort of an R group. Now this is our monomer. It's a big one, but this is a monomer. And if we were to add another monomer to it, we're already figuring out what we're looking at is a dehydration reaction because we've highlighted this hydrogen, this hydrogen and this hydroxide right here. And when we put these two together, Basically, what we're creating is a, is a polymer. So this polymer is being created, synthesized, if you will, by a dehydration reaction. And in fact, this is how we, we set about creating proteins. Here we've just got a couple of uh, amino acids together, but we could very easily add another amino acid to this end, which would be analogous to this end, and um, create another water molecule and continue to grow our protein chain. So this is an example of um, a pattern that we see in the body. We just saw it in uh, carbohydrates, and we're now seeing it in proteins. So while we're talking about carbohydrates, let's just go ahead and talk about carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are these big molecules, and they're going to include sugars as well as uh, substances that are called starches. And they're going to be put together with the atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And if we look at the ratios, we're going to have about twice as many hydrogens as we have oxygens um, in these molecules. Typically, we're going to have a whole lot of carbons, too.
So we have uh, three classes of carbohydrates, and it's based upon the number of monomers. So for example, we have a monosaccharide, which is a single sugar, so it would be a, a single sugar ring, such as this. And then we have a disaccharide, which is based, made up of two sugar rings. Di means two. Bi also means two, but di does as well. And uh, this is an example of a disaccharide where you have two sugar rings bound together. So a polysaccharide, this is when we have many sugar rings put together. And these are going to be uh, polymers, as the name uh, poly implies. These are going to be polymers made up of monomers of monosaccharides. So we're going to take these um, these sorts of uh, molecules, glucose molecules, for example, and we're going to string them together in elaborate structures. Uh, one elaborate structure is cellulose. This is what plants make. We can think of this as plant fiber. And if we look at this, here we have a sugar ring. It's bound to this sugar ring, but it's also bound to this one. And if we look at the uh, this one, it's bound to these two. And if we look at this one, it's bound to this one over here on this chain. But it's also bound to the one before it and the one after it in its own chain. So this is an elaborate construction where we have sugar rings bound together um, in uh, repeating monomers, giving us this elaborate polysaccharide structure. Now, where do we get carbohydrates from? Well, most are going to come from plants. Either they're coming directly from plants themselves or some sort of plant product. Because uh, if you think about it, sugar is comes from sugar cane, which is a plant. It also comes from um, uh, beets, which are plants. Uh, it also comes in the form of honey, because honey is sugar. But it's made by bees from plant products. So we can think of carbohydrates mostly coming from plants. There is one exception, which is uh, milk sugar, which comes from cows, which are cows are not plants. But they eat plants in order to make milk. <laughs> so more or less, it's all coming from plants, either directly or, or indirectly. So why do we even eat carbohydrates? Well, the whole purpose of eating carbohydrates is ultimately to attain those those glucose molecules so that we can create fuel because you remember um, cells will take glucose and in the presence of oxygen it's going to make that cellular energy known as ATP. This is what's happening in the Krebs cycle. Fortunately we don't have to learn about this until you get into AMP2 but eventually you're going to have to learn the Krebs cycle. But for now we can just basically say that glucose, here's our glucose, in the presence of oxygen is going to create ATP and water along with some carbon dioxide. Now, some of the cells in the body are going to be able to use different substances aside from carbohydrates and glucose as fuel source, but some very important cells in the body can't. And those cells include nerves, the brain, and the spinal cord, as well as red blood cells. These cells rely exclusively on glucose presented to them in order to be able to do their cellular functions and make their cellular energy. And that's important because your brain needs to function. Like I said, many other cells in the body can make glucose from either proteins or fats, but the brain can't. And we need the brain to function all the time. So you always have to have a steady supply of glucose in your diet in order to feed your brain. So let's talk about lipids. So when we're talking about lipids, we're basically talking about fats. And there's a lot of different types of fats, but we're just going to generally kind of call them lipids or fats for now. Now, when we look at these molecules, what we're going to notice is that they're made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, just like carbohydrates. But the proportions are going to be a little different, and uh, their configurations will be a little bit different as well. And um, their behaviors will be different as a result of both of those. Sometimes we also see a phosphate in lipids, uh, so we'll point all of that out once we get there. Now the thing about lipids, which is different than carbohydrates, is that lipids don't play well with water. Remember when we looked at um, fats and uh, water or oil and water and we saw that they were separate? That's what we're talking about when we say that lipids are insoluble in water. Now when we're talking about lipids, there are several main types. We have triglycerides or neutral fats, that's what they're also called. We have phospholipids. We actually took a, took a look at those 
earlier, and we pointed out that those were what are making up cell membranes, among other structures. Hey, and then we have steroids. So we have some interesting things to talk about, so let's get started. So we're going to start off by talking about triglycerides. Now the prefix tri means three, and then we have this glycer, um, glyceride. What is that? Well, this is telling you about the parts of the molecule because um, words mean things. So when we're talking about triglycerides, basically what we're talking about is a molecule that has three fatty acid chains, and these are our three fatty acid chains right here. And if we look at what we have, we have carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And this carbon is bound to this carbon, which has a couple of hydrogens attached to it. And there can be many of these. That's why we have them in parentheses and a little uh, subscript here that says we can have 10 of these. We could have 13. It just depends on which fatty acid we're talking about. And then we're going to conclude this chain with this configuration right here. This is called a methyl group, where you have a carbon and three hydrogens. But this is representative of a fatty acid chain, as is this one and this one. And we're going to have three of them, hence the word tri. Now, where does the glyceride come from? Well, it comes from this molecule right here, which is called a glycerol molecule. Now, in these structures, in these molecules, what you're going to have is a combination of this glycerol molecule and these three fatty acid chains. And they're going to join together, and they're going to form this molecule right here. So just so you can see what we, uh, where everything came from, this part came from our glycerol, and then these three parts came from our fatty acid chains. Now, what does the body do with uh, triglycerides? Well, mostly energy storage. Uh, insulation is another function of fat that we put on the body or inside the body, as is protection. So you might think, protection, how is that the case? Well, believe it or not, your kidneys, which are very vital organs, are packed in fat. Not only are they protected by ribs because they're tucked up underneath the bottom part of the rib cage, they're also surrounded by fat. That's what we mean. Now you may have heard the term saturated fat and maybe you've heard the term unsaturated fats. And maybe you know what those mean, maybe you don't, but we're going to go over it right now. So when we think about our triglyceride molecule, we have three little fatty acid chains hanging off of there. And the uh, configuration of those fatty acid chains are going to depend uh, on the arrangement of the carbons and the hydrogens that are making up most of those chains. So here on this slide, we're going to be talking about saturated fatty acids. And if we look at the structure of this particular chain, we have in the middle, not, not including what we have at either end, but in the middle, we have a carbon bound to another carbon, and each carbon is bound to two hydrogens. And we see that repeated all the way over until we get to either end. Now, when we have this sort of configuration, what we have is a molecule that has the maximum number of hydrogen atoms possible. That is, we have a, a hydrogen attached to every carbon in this chain, and that's why we call it saturated. That's because this fatty acid is saturated with hydrogens. Now, these type of fats have a tendency to be solid at room temperature. These are going to be your um, animal fats. These are going to be your uh, butter. Butter tends to stay solid at room temperature unless you live in South Texas or Florida. Um, uh, even things like Crisco have been modified so that they stay solid at room temperature. So these are saturated fats. Now, if saturated fats have all of these hydrogens, then we can conclude, even before we get to that slide, that unsaturated fats have to be absent a couple of hydrogens. So how does that work? So we can take one look at this slide, and we see we have something very different. Uh, and it has to do with what's happening right here. So what is that about? Well, if we know that saturated fatty acids have all the hydrogens possible, we can see that there's something missing down here at the bottom of both of these carbons. Both of these carbons are missing a hydrogen. And as a result, because remember, each one of these carbons wants to have an octet in its valence 
orbital. And in order to achieve that, it has to share some electrons somewhere, so it's going to end up sharing an additional pair of electrons with each other. And that's what we see represented here with this, these two, uh, two lines. This represents a double bond, sh the sharing of four electrons between these two carbons. Now, what's, what's happening here is, um, is that once you have the presence of these double bonds, it's going to change the physical characteristics of this fatty acid. And the most noticeable one is that the um, the fatty acids here are going to be liquid at room temperature. So what are we thinking? Well, we're thinking corn oil, uh, olive oil, walnut oil. Um, actually, most of your nut oils, maybe not palm, um, and or coconut, but most of your nut oils are and um, many of your vegetable oils are going to be. Um, liquid at room temperature. And the reason why is they're going to have at least one double bond in their fatty acid chains. Now, we say here on the slide that trans, uh, trans fats are modified oils and they're typically unhealthy. What do we mean by trans fats? Well, let's just start by examining what we have here on uh, in front of us. So we see that we have a carbon-to-carbon a -carbon bond right here and this double bond. What a double bond does is it basically holds all the atoms that are uh, attached in that bond and two atoms that are involved in that bond stationary. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that in this particular carbon, these two hydrogens can spin around this carbon like the blades of a propeller. But because we have uh, this carbon to carbon bond right here, each of these hydrogens are stuck in their position because this double bond doesn't allow for any spin between uh, these two carbons. So when we have these two hydrogens stuck in the up position, this is what we would call a cis configuration. Body likes that. That's healthy. But if we had this hydrogen pointing down, now we have a trans configuration. And the body doesn't like this. Body has a little trouble dealing with this one. And it's unhealthy for the body. So we don't typically like to go with trans fats in our diets. But what the takeaway is from this slide is that we want you to have an understanding of what is involved when we're differentiating between trans fats and unsaturated fats. And the difference is that a saturated fat has all, all the hydrogens that it can around the, its carbons. And in an unsaturated fat, not only are we absent at least two, two hydrogens, but we're going to have a double bond which is going to create this kink or bend in our fatty acid. So let's talk about steroids. And yes, steroids are lipids. So what is a steroid? Well, it's a type of a molecule that consists of four interlocking rings. And it has a basic structure like what we see here. So what are we looking at here? Well, I'll tell you, at each one of these corners is going to be a carbon. And each one of these carbons will have two hydrogens bound to it. And then at this corner where you have three lines coming off, there's a carbon there, and there'll be one hydrogen bound to it. So basically what we're looking at are rings of carbons with some hydrogens hanging off of it. And it's easier to see the structure like this than to actually draw it with all those carbons and hydrogens in place. So this is a chemistry shorthand notation so that we can get an idea of what the structure looks like without being distracted with all the things hanging off of it. So that's what we're looking at. So uh, what's the body doing with steroids? Well, um, it's doing a lot of things with steroids. When we think about common steroids in the body, cholesterol is one of them. Let's bring up cholesterol. So there's the structure of cholesterol. Now, cholesterol has the four ring structures, and we'll notice that there's a little variation right here. We have a double bond between these two carbons, but that's okay. A little variation we can handle, but, but it's easy to see the lineage of where the molecule comes from because of the, four, the basic structure of um, the four rings that are in place. Let's look at vitamin D. So we're going to see a little bit of variation in vitamin D as well. So we have a double bond right here, and we have an open structure right there. That's not a big deal we can still tell that vitamin D has come from this four ring structure, which is why it's classified as a steroid. 
Uh, and we have a variety of steroid hormones in the body. So for example, the sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, all of those are steroid-based hormones. So let's take a look at uh, one of them. Here we have progesterone. Now progesterone, we can see, has the four ring structure. We have a double bond here, but we know where it came from. It came from this, the basis of this, to get this. Now what's progesterone doing for us? Progesterone is basically helping maintain the uterine lining in a female, and if there's implantation of a fertilized egg, it'll maintain uh, the pregnancy. That's pretty amazing. So let's see, what is uh, vitamin D doing for us? Well, vitamin D helps us with a few things. One of the things that it helps us do is manage our calcium levels, but it also seems to play a role in helping modulate uh, neurotransmitters and uh, 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 control mood, prevent us from being depressed. So uh, slightly different structures having huge differences. What about this steroid hormone right here, aldosterone? Well, we can see very similar to uh, progesterone, just a few additional things hanging off, Slight, slightly different configuration. And aldosterone is the primary hormone that's used to manage fluid balance in the body. It goes to work in the kidneys, moving sodium around in order to move water around. Just a tweaking of that molecule has a really different structure, different function in the body. Very similar structure as progesterone but very different function overall in the body. And then we also said bile salts. Here's bile salts right here. This is cholic acid, it's one of the bile salts. So these are put together by the liver. They're stored in the gallbladder until we need them to digest fat. So this gets released into the intestinal tract. And what these do is they help break down the big globs of fat into small globs of fat so that our enzymes can break it down into things that we can utilize. So all coming from uh, uh, the steroid base of this four ring structure, but just these five right here, very different uses in the body. Perhaps of all of these, the most important steroid is cholesterol. And the reason why is because cholesterol ends up being the foundational building block for everything else, whether it's vitamin D, all the various steroid hormones such as progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, um, aldosterone, cortisol, um, just to name a few, um, as well as all the bile salts. Now another important thing that cholesterol is doing for us is that it's providing some important structure to cell membrane. Now why do we need that? Well, if we, think about, if we think back about what we know about cell membranes, we know that they're basically uh, these phospholipid molecules that are kind of adhered together with the phosphate heads out and the fatty tails pointed towards the middle, basically creating a, an organized fat slick. Now, as we know with most fats, they're very fluid and flowy, very oily, in fact. Um, and that doesn't make for the greatest membrane in the world. So what the body does is it'll insert cholesterol molecules in there, and that helps give that plasma membrane some rigidity and helps hold it together and give the cells some shape. So do we need fats? Do we need steroids? Absolutely we do. We just don't need too many. Now we've already talked about phospholipids and we looked at the structure and we said that we have this phosphate head here and then we had a couple of fatty acid tails hanging off. Now technically what we have here is a glycerol molecule with two fatty acids hanging off of it. If we had had a third fatty acid hanging off of it we would have called it a, a triglyceride. But instead of a, another fatty acid we have this phosphate group. And for that reason we would call a phospholipid a modified triglyceride. And as we've already studied, the phosphate heads bear a little bit of a charge, which makes them hydrophilic. And the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. And uh, this configuration makes it perfect if we want to organize a cell membrane in a water environment, which is what we do. So let's talk about proteins. Now, when we're talking about proteins, we're talking about uh, 
structures that are going to make up about 20 to 30 percent of all cell mass. That's quite a bit. And when we think about the biological molecules, the organic molecules, the carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, um, proteins are going to have more varied function than any of those other molecules. So we, we know that carbohydrates are all about energy, giving us energy. The thing we didn't talk about with carbohydrates is that carbohydrates are also used as signaling molecules. They'll be put on the surface of cells to act as a as a form of identity, like a name tag that says this belongs to Rebecca or maybe this belongs to you. And uh, that, lets, that lets our immune system, for one, know that either we're uh, dealing with a cell that's friendly to us and part of our body or not, which is an important feature that the, the immune system has to be able to, to, to exhibit, to recognize self. So yeah, carbohydrates are used for that as well. It's just a couple of different functions there. When we talked about lipids, we said, well, lipids could be used as a fuel storage mechanism. Yeah, that's true. Um, they could be used as hormones. We saw that. They could be used as cell membranes. So we talked about a few more functions that lipids were performing for us. But when it comes to proteins, we're looking at a lot of different functions. So for example, proteins can be structural. Our, our hair, our nails, our skin, our bones, these are all made out of proteins, in part, not entirely, but in part. Our red blood cells are made out of proteins, in part. That's what hemoglobin is. Uh, the enzymes that we use to do anabolic and catabolic processes, those are proteins. Many of our hormones, in fact, most of our hormones are proteins. Our muscles are made out of proteins. So all very different functions, and I'm just giving you some of them. There's more because there's I actually said one more than's on this slide. So there's a lot of different functions that proteins are doing for us, more so than any other cell molecule type that we're going to look at. So when we think about the atoms that are making up proteins, it shouldn't come as a, as a surprise that we're going to have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now we've already looked at proteins once and we learned that nitrogen is also a component of all amino acids, which means that it's going to be a component of proteins. And sometimes we have sulfur. Sulfur is a component of some amino acids, which means it'll show up in proteins, as will phosphorus. But mostly we're looking at carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Now, when we looked at dehydration reactions, we used the combining of two amino acids to give an example of that process in the body. And so from this, we were able to determine that we could take the monomers of amino acids and put them together to create polymers of proteins. Now, where the um, amino acids come together, that's a special type of bond, and we call it a peptide bond. And we'll look at that once we actually start knitting amino acids together, because we are going to be doing some of that. Now, when it comes to proteins, the function of a protein is going to be due to its shape. In fact, that's so important, I'm going to say it again. When it comes to proteins, the function of a protein is going to be due largely to its shape. Now, when we talk about crafting a protein, there are several structural levels that we have to go through. One of those is, it, is going to involve making sure that we have um, the right amino acids in the right sequence. And then once we make this really, really super long chain of amino acids, we're going to give it one folding pattern. And then once we get done with that, we're going to give it a second folding pattern. It's starting to get a little complex. And then once we're done with that, we're going to take that protein and we're going to drop it into a complex of other proteins that are just like it. And now we've got a functional unit. So it is the, it's the string of the amino acids folded twice and then placed with other functional units of protein in order for us to have a protein that functions the way that we want, that we want it to. So how important is this? Well, let me give you an example. Here we have a protein that naturally occurs in nature, and then here's a variation of it. 
Now that doesn't look like a great big difference that happened here. And in fact, what we have is still the same amino acids in the same sequence, but we have a little bit of a, a change in the folding pattern. We can see that we've lost one of our helix because uh, it's absent here, and we've instead gained a uh, some sort of a weirdness bit over here. So what's the difference between these pro these two proteins as far as function? Well, nothing with this one. This one is normal. We expect to see this one in nature, but this one, this one can eat your brain. This one is called mad cow disease. <laughs> Now, how do we put together a protein? Well, we put a protein together with amino acids, and there are 20 different amino acids that we can choose from. So let's talk a little bit about uh, amino acids and how they are put together. So when we look at an amino acid, we know that it's going to contain an amine group and an acid group, specifically a carboxylic acid group. So down here in the bottom of the slide, I have a picture of an amino acid. And off to the left where we have our nitrogen, this is where we're going to have our amine group. And on the other end, where we have the carbon and the oxygen and the uh, hydroxide ion, this is going to be our acid group, carboxylic acid. Now, another interesting feature of amino acids is that they can act either as an acid or a base. Now, how do they do that? Well, it has to do with this hydrogen right here. Because this hydrogen doesn't always like to hang out right there with that oxygen. It can run off and provide a proton to some other molecule, in which case our amino acid has acted like an acid and been a proton donor. Or once that spot has been vacated, now we have this empty spot where uh, a hydrogen ion can show up and uh, now our amino acid is acting like a base. Now most of the time this hydrogen doesn't like to hang out here with this oxygen. It would rather come over here and hang out with this nitrogen. Now when it does that, it's going to leave behind its electron because remember our buddy, the oxygen, it's an electron hog. And uh, it's going to be hanging on to that electron most of the time anyway. So hydrogen just looks like, well, see ya, bye-bye. I'm going to go hang out with my nitrogen friend. Now when it shows up at nitrogen, it's going to be bringing with it its proton, which means now we're going to have a slight positive charge over here uh, on this end of the molecule. Now, if we look at this, we have basically created some polarity with this move. So we now have a slight positive charge in our amine area and a slight negative charge in our acid area. And this means that this, this, this uh, amino acid can now integrate easily into water. It can dissolve into water because, you know, water likes to uh, welcome in things that have some sort of a charge to it or maybe even just a polarity or a positive or negative region somewhere across the molecule. And this certainly fits the bill. So this is how our amino acid ends up acting like an acid or a base. Because now that we've vacated this right here, um, we now have created a spot for a hydrogen to come and occupy. And that means now our, our amino acid acts like a base. Typically, the hydrogen is not going to go over here. This hydrogen will actually leave the molecule and go somewhere else and uh, kind of leaving a deficit right here. And in that way, our, our amino acid can act like a base. That's really what's happening. Now, I said that we have 20 different amino acids. And how is it that we can end up with 20 of them when all of them are going to have an amine group off to the left and a carboxylic acid group to the right? Well, it has to do with this group right here, the R group. It is the R group, this, this side chain, that gives the amino acids their identity. And there are 20 different side chains that we see, which is why we have 20 different amino acids. So let's take a look at them. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I do want to point out as we go through these, uh, or at least starting to, that over here off to the left, we have the amine group. There's our nitrogen. And over here, we have the carboxylic acid group. Now, on my slide, I showed this doubly bonded oxygen going up. But on, this, on these charts, it's going to be showing it going down. And the reason why is that we're going to have to make room for the, the side chains. Now, glycine is the simplest of the amino acids. Its side chain is just simply a hydrogen. But if we look at alanine, we've got a slightly larger side chain. If we look at valine, bigger again. Now we've got some branching. And leucine gets bigger again. 
So now you can start to see why they, they drew the oxygen in the downward position. Not that it really matters because um, there's a single bond here and a single bond here, which means that that oxygen can spin around that carbon. Um, and if we look at each one of these successive side chains, we can see they're becoming more elaborate. We're starting to now integrate some of those ring structures that we talked about when we were talking about steroids. We don't see four ring structures, but we do see a couple, and they're rather big. And uh, uh, here's our, so here's, here's some of them. This is the nonpolar um, amino acids. Let's take a look at some more of these. Here we have five amino acids that have some sort of polarity to them. So if we look at uh, aspartic acid and, and uh, glutamic acid, they actually have a carboxylic acid group at the end, which is why they're considered acidic. But over here, look, we have basically an amine group uh, um, that is creating some sort of a, a basic quality in these three amino acids. And they're getting pretty big. And here are some more, and we can see, again, uh, structures. So we have hydroxides being added into the mix. And here we have a sulfur. There's our sulfur, because we said some of these are going to have sulfur. Um, and again, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Yep, that's what we expect to see. So there's your 20 amino acids. Now we said earlier that amino acids are bound together by what are called peptide bonds. So let's actually look at the creation of a peptide bond. Now we have two amino acids over here on the left. And if we look at how they're oriented, in both cases we have the amine group off to the left and the carboxylic acid group off to the right. Side chain is up. All right, now in order to merge these two, we're going to be doing a synthesis reaction. And we know that a synthesis reaction is going to involve dehydration. And we can already see what our targets are from each one of these amino acids. We've got this hydroxide that we're going to take off, and we have this hydrogen that we're going to take off. Because remember, we have to create a spot where these two, uh, these two amino acids can merge. So a dehydration synthesis is going to allow um, the acid of one amino group to bond to the amine of the other group and we're going to we're going to make that happen by removing a water molecule so let's go ahead and remove the water molecule and we have merged our two amino acids now where they come together which is at the carbon of the carboxylic acid group of one amine and the nitrogen of the uh, amine group of the other amino acid i think i said amine a minute ago um, so the carboxylic acid group of this amino acid and the nitrogen from the amine group of this amino acid, where these join together, this is what's called a peptide bond. So that's how we merge amino acids. We take away uh, a, a hydroxide from a carboxylic acid, a hydrogen from the amine, and then we create that peptide bond. Now we have this labeled as a dipeptide. Di means two, and it's because we put two of these little amino acids together. And when we start stringing them together, we call, we call it a peptide. Initially, uh, the joining of amino acids uh, is called a peptide, and that's if we just have a few together. So we have a dipeptide. If we were to add a third amino acid, we would have a tripeptide. If we add any more than that, we would call it a polypeptide, and it would remain a polypeptide until we got to about 80 or 100 amino acids in a chain. At that point, we would call it a protein. Now, some proteins are as small as you know, 80 to 100 amino acids in a chain. Some are as large as 2,000 amino acids in a, in a chain. In the body, for us, most of them are going to come in um, somewhere around 1,000, usually less than 1,000. But we do have some uh, proteins that have about 2,000 amino acids in their chain. And that's a lot because those, those amino acids have to be in the correct sequence in order for that protein to work correctly. That's a lot to keep track of. All right, so we've talked about our dehydration synthesis. What if we wanted to break down this, this peptide bond? What would we do then? Well, that would be a hydrolysis reaction. And in this case, we're actually going to have to take a water molecule and add it into the reaction. 
in order to break up the peptide bond and replace those vacated bonds with the hydroxide and the hydrogen. So there you have it, a little bit about peptide bonds. Now, when we started this section on proteins, I really leaned into the importance of the structure of protein with regard to its functionality. And in this section, we're going to be looking at the various levels of the structure. And there's going to be four. There's the first one, which is the primary structure. And this is the linear sequence of amino acids. And we'll talk a bit more about each one of these in the following slides. Um, the second uh, level of structure is going to be how the amino acids interact with each other because there are some intermolecular bonds that get created between uh, certain structures in the amino acids. Um, and this is going to lead to what's called the alpha helix, which is a coiled shape, as well as the beta pleated sheets. And we'll look at that. Then the third level is the tertiary level of structure, and this is how the secondary structures, the side chains, interact with each other. And then finally, there's what's called the quaternary uh, structure, which is when you take a couple of, uh, of um, these proteins that we just made and put them together in order to create something that functions. So let's take a little bit deeper dive into each one of these and, and add a bit more clarity. Now, as I said, the primary structure is going to be that linear sequence of amino acids. It's basically the amino acids in a specific sequence according to how our DNA says this recipe should read. So what we have here is we have this amino acid, and we don't know what it is. We're just generically calling it R. That's what that R stands for. And then here's our second amino acid, and here's another one. And it might be something like glycine, alanine, uh, valine, and then another uh, glycine. And you, just, you know, whatever it is, whatever the recipe for that that uh, that protein is, this is our starting point: getting the amino acids and getting them in the right order. Because remember, these are going to be linked together in, in a chain. They're attached to each other by way of that, that peptide bond. Now, the secondary level of structure is going to involve how the amino acids interact with each other. And specifically, what we're talking about is the first folding pattern that is created based upon the interactions of the amines and the carboxylic acid groups in our amino acid chain. Because our amines have hydrogens attached to them, and our carboxylic acid has an oxygen. And we know that hydrogen and oxygen like to form hydrogen bonds. So if we look at what we have here on this beta sheet, this little red dot is going to be our oxygen, and we can see that it's created this little dotted line with the blue, which is the hydrogen that's attached to this amine right here. So the interactions between the hydrogens on the nitrogen and the oxygen on the carbon in our our amino acids are going to create these alpha helices, the little coiled structures that we see here, as well as the beta pleated sheets. I, I think these look very much like corrugated tin, uh, and this clearly looks like a like a like a helix. But that's what's creating that secondary structure. It's the, it's the intermolecular forces based upon hydrogen bonding between hydrogens on the end, the nitrogen of the amine, and the oxygen that remains on the carboxylic acid carbon. Now the third structural layer is going to be the tertiary layer, and this is how the secondary structures interact. What do we mean by that? Well, this is the second folding pattern, and it's going to be based on the interactions of the side chains, those R groups that we looked at. And these are also going to form hydrogen bonds. We don't get to see that in the picture, but they're going to do the same thing that we saw that the hydrogens of the amine groups and the oxygen on the carboxylic acid groups doing. They're going to create a second layer of folding because they're going to interact with each other. Now, at this point, we could have a functional protein. It might not be a great big one, but we could have a functional protein. But typically what happens is that this tertiary structure ends up becoming a part of a complex of proteins, and that leads us to our fourth and final layer of structure. So let's take a look at that. <laughs> 
Now, as I said on the previous slide, it's very possible that the tertiary layer could be the final destination for a particular protein. It may be a small protein that does just fine without being part of a complex of proteins. But if uh, but we do find that many proteins do have to function as part of a complex, and that's where this quaternary level of structure comes into play. So the quaternary structure is we basically made our protein and we folded it up twice, and now that's going to be added to at least another protein, maybe another three proteins, in order to create this structure that now becomes functional. So what you're seeing in this picture is that you have a tertiary structure here, tertiary structure here, and then one in back, and then the other one in back. So in this particular uh, uh, protein, we actually have four proteins. What we mean here by polypeptide is, is um, is a number of amino acids in a chain and we don't know how many amino acids there are there um, and and you might be confused by the language polypeptide just means more than three peptides could be and in this case the the author is using it to designate that it is a longer chain but it isn't willing to call it a protein I think so that we can differentiate between a functional protein something that is going to act as intended versus something that's not quite ready to so um, I would use the word protein here instead of polypeptide but they could be used interchangeably what the author is trying to tell you is that we're going to take this unit that we just created that's not functional by itself, add it to another three, and then we get our functional protein. That's what's, what's trying to be conveyed here. Chemistry is so much fun <laughs> when it comes to the semantics. So now that we've had the tour of what it takes to make a protein and have an understanding that there's folding patterns that are that have to be put in place as well as the specific chain, um, that leads us to understand how that structure really influences how that protein behaves. Now when we look at proteins, we're going to see two general categories based upon their shape. One is going to be a fibrous protein and the other one is going to be globular or globular. So what is the difference? Well, let's start off by talking about the fibrous proteins. These, as the name implies, are going to be strand-like structures, um, typically water insoluble. So even though we know that some proteins can be absorbed into water, uh, many of them are going to be folded in such a, a way that those little charged areas are going to be tucked inside the protein and so what's on the outside the part that would have to work with water would actually have no charge and make them more like a lipid and that would not allow them to play nicely in water so uh, fibers are going to be structural proteins um, strand like proteins like we think of uh, most of these proteins are going to have a tertiary or a quaternary structure but not necessarily um, and when we think about fiber structures, what they're doing for us is they're creating some sort of mechanical support. And the reason why is that they have uh, tensile strength to them. Um, they can be compressed uh, a little bit, but the, the big payoff with these structures is that when you tug on them, they just have a lot of strength. So what sort of uh, uh, examples can we give in the body where we would find these fibrous proteins? Well, keratin. Now you might not know this yet, but keratin is the protein that's found in your hair, in your nails, in your skin. So pretty tough stuff, that keratin. Elastin. Elastin is found in your skin. It's also found in ligaments and tendons, so it's very tough stuff. Collagen. Collagen is the single most abund abundant protein in the body. That's saying something. And we find collagen everywhere. It's in your skin. It's in your bones. It's, it's in pretty much all the tissues because of the type of strength that it gives to our physical substance. And then we have certain contractile fibers. Uh, so for example, the, the covering of, of muscles known as fascia has the ability to contract and we're going to find a great deal of collagen covering muscle. So let's take a look at some of these. So actually this is keratin right here. It's a, a clearly an alpha helix structure, so it's got a lot of lot of um, spin to it. Now, if we're talking about the alpha helix structure, where does that come in? 
Does it come in at the primary level or the secondary level or the tertiary level? Well, it comes in at the secondary level. Because remember, secondary level, that first folding pattern, is what gives us the alpha helix or the beta sheets. So what we're looking at here with keratin is um, at least these strands, we're looking at the secondary structure. We don't see a tertiary structure here. But as we said, most will have a tertiary structure, but not all. This is elastin. Do we see a, a, a secondary structure, a tertiary structure? What do we see here? Well, I can see some beta sheets here. Looks like we have a little alpha helix business there. And it almost looks like, based upon coloring, we have maybe one protein here and maybe another protein here and maybe another one there. So maybe we are looking at a tertiary structure, maybe even a quaternary structure. And here we have collagen. So I see alpha, alpha helices, I see beta sheets. Yep. Okay. So let's look at the uh, globular proteins. Now globular means rounded, so what we're looking at here are going to be compact, spherical, water-soluble um, structures that are sensitive to environmental changes. Now, um, in sensitive to environmental changes, what does that mean? Well, it basically means that based upon what's happening around the protein, the protein can respond by altering its shape. So that sounds like a foreign concept, but let's think just about what you know about blood. We know that blood likes to carry oxygen to deliver it from the lungs to the tissues. Now, how does it do that? Well, it, within the protein structure of hemoglobin, there's a little area where the oxygen can sit. And when oxygen sits there, it actually causes that, that globular protein to change shape. So that's the perfect example of, uh, of having a globular protein be sensitive to environmental changes. Typically, these are going to have a tertiary quaternary structure, and they're going to have specific functional regions, which we call active sites. Now, I referred to active sites when we were talking about the enzymes, and I said that our substrate, whether it's a big molecule or, or a couple of small molecules, are going to sit in the active site. And that's where some work is going to be done. So here we see this functional area, the area of the protein that's capable of doing some work, being listed as the active site. And remember when I talked about vitamins and minerals, and I said they help out with enzymes? That's because those vitamins and minerals will also partially occupy the active site to ensure that there's a better fit between the active site and whatever that target molecule is for that active site. So what are some examples of globular proteins? Well, antibodies, you know, the things that are part of our immune system that help us fight diseases, those are actually globular proteins. Many of our hormones are globular proteins. Uh, we have molecular chaperones. Now, what is a molecular chaperone? Well, remember when I was talking about the structure of proteins and I said there's a particular folding pattern that has to happen at the secondary level as well as the tertiary level? Well, those don't happen by magic. There are actually some proteins there that are called chaperone proteins that will help assist in the folding pattern. That's what I mean by that. And then enzymes. Enzymes are also going to be globular proteins. So let's take a look at some examples. So for example, this is an antibody. And an antibody has a number of protein strands involved. We can easily see one is here, one is here, and one is here. And even in this particular image, the uh, author is telling you that right here is the active site. So when this antibody goes up to a pathogen or a, a, such as a bacteria or a virus, it's going to attach to it right there or maybe over here. <laughs> but typically somewhere out here on one of these upper structures. That's the active site. This is insulin. Insulin is a hormone. And we can clearly see that we're looking at a quaternary structure because here's a protein and here's another protein and here's another protein. So this is an example of a protein that's a globular structure. This is uh, lactase. 
Lactase is an enzyme that digests milk sugars. And it too is globular in its structure. So this is the last topic in this unit. This is going to be the last of the organic molecules, nucleic acids. So it should come as no surprise that nucleic acids are composed of the atoms made of uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and some phosphorus. And these are going to be the largest molecules in the body. These are going to be bigger than the proteins that we just studied. Now, nucleic acids are going to be polymers, and they're going to be made up of monomers called nucleotides. So how do we put together a nucleotide? Well, it's going to involve a nitrogenous base, which is a substance that has nitrogen as one of its primary ingredients. And this is going to be attached to a pentose sugar, which means that it is a five-carboned ring, a five-sided ring called uh, ribose. And uh, then we're going to have a phosphate group attached to it. Now, as you look at this, hopefully this is going to remind you of something that you saw earlier in the lecture. Uh, so let's say that we added a couple of more phosphates to it. What does this look like? Well, hopefully you said it looks like ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And in fact, that's what we would have if instead of saying just some generic nitrogenous base, we actually said adenosine right here. But we're talking about nucleic acids making uh, nucleotides, or the monomers of nucleotides. So we're actually going to lop off these two phosphates and just go with this. Now, like I said, when Mother Nature finds a system that works, she tends to repeat it throughout the body. And this is an example of that. So not only does Mother Nature use systems of polymers, that is taking uh, molecule parts, monomers, and then stringing them together to do things, she'll actually replicate the format of certain molecules in order to get things accomplished. And this is an example of that. So if we, depending upon what sort of base that we have here, we're either going to make a nucleotide or we can be making another biologically active molecule called uh, adenosine monophosphate. Uh, that is a different molecule. We're not going to study that, but that is possible if we had adenosine here. And we would call it adenosine monophosphate because we have an adenosine and we have one phosphate there. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out, uh, that this is not necessarily absolutely new information. We've seen this before. It's just we're tweaking it a little bit. We're going to modify what, which nitrogenous base we use, and we're going to just uh, bring it down to one phosphate. But we are going to string these together, and we're going to make nucleic acids. So when we're talking about nucleic acids, we have two major classes of these. One of them is called DNA, and the other one is called RNA. So DNA stands for deoxy ribonucleic acid. Well, the ribo is this part right here, and we see that word present in DNA as well as RNA, but what do we mean by deoxy? Well, let's actually bring up uh, both of these molecules, and I'll show you. So again, this is showing you all the carbons and hydrogens and hydroxides that go into making a ribose molecule, but you'll notice in this position right here coming off this second carbon, Deoxyribose doesn't have an oxygen attached there, but ribose does. That's the difference. So deoxy means no oxygen off of this one, two second carbon. And ribose means that there is an oxygen off that second carbon. Now, nucleic acids, um, when we think about DNA, what is DNA doing for us? Well, DNA is going to hold the genetic information that tells us how to produce proteins. Basically, our DNA is a big cookbook that contains all the recipes on how to make proteins. That's what it is. And if we look at the structure of DNA, it's going to be uh, two strands of nucleotides forming chains, and those two strands are going to be held together by hydrogen bonds, and that's what's going to give it that, that, that helical twist. Now that shouldn't come as any surprise to us because as we learned in how to make a protein, it is the uh, uh, intermolecular forces between um, different molecules from uh, those strands of monomers, the strands of the nucleotides, that are going to create this, this unique twist that we see. Uh, we saw that present in proteins. We see it here present in the nucleic acids.
And like we said, uh, a nucleotide is going to be made, made up of that uh, sugar ring, in this case deoxygenated ribose. Uh, we're going to have a phosphate group hanging off to the left, and then we're going to have one of four nucleotides up there where we had um, uh, um, adenine when we were talking about ATP. We could have adenine, but we could also have guanine, or we could have another one that's called cytosine or thymine. So let's bring up pictures of each one of these because I'm making a distinction here between a purine and a, a pyrimidine. So let's see what the difference is. So our purines are going to be adenine and guanine. Now uh, the thing that we notice that's similar about these two molecules is that each one has a, um, a carbon ring that forms uh, the base of its structure. Whereas pyrimidines are just going to have a single carbon ring as the base of their structure. And then whatever is coming off of those, whatever attachments we have to either that double, that double carbon ring or the single carbon ring, that's what's going to give identity to our molecule. So these slight variations create uh, a difference in behaviors because we have different types of molecules there. But these are going to be the four that are going to occupy that yellow um, square that we have on our nucleotide. So let's actually look at that. So this is the basic overall structure of our nucleotide. And as our instructions say, we're going to have a ribose sugar here. In this case, the one without the hydrogen, excuse me, without the oxygen on this second carbon. We're going to have a phosphate right here. And then we're going to have this space right here being occupied by one of four of these nitrogenous bases. Now, why are we calling them nitrogenous bases? Because look at all the nitrogen that is populating these uh, molecules. That's why. So we could have in this position, we could have adenine, um, and that's what we saw when we were talking about ATP was a, um, adeno um, triphosphate because we had an adenine there plus uh, two additional phosphates over here. Um, but instead of adenine, we could easily have guanine, that could be there, or we could have cytosine, or we could have thymine. So these are going to be the four nucleotides that get put together in particular sequences that are going to make up the two strands of our DNA. Now, as stated previously, our two strands of nucleotides are going to be held together through hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is going to occur based upon which nitrogenous bases are going to be paired together. And the rules of putting those pairs together uh, are real specific. And in fact, we call it complementary base pairing rules. And these are the rules right here. That you always have A and T going together, which means adenine and thymine. And you always have guanine and cy uh, cytosine always going together. Now, if we bring these up and take a look, we can almost see why that's the case. It has a little bit to do with real estate. So for example, this is a very big molecule, and this is a very small molecule. And as they fit together, um, this basically minimizes the space that exists between the two strands. Also, it allows for hydrogen bonding to occur between these two molecules. And if we look at uh, guanine and cytosine, we're going to see the same thing. So basically, the way that this all works out is that um, the optimal hydrogen bonding occurs between a pyrimidine and a purine, and it works out best if it is between the, uh, the, the pyrimidine and purines, uh, adenine and thymosine, and guanine and cytosine. This is a great image because it shows you the interaction that's happening between um, adenine and thymine. And if we look at this image, we can see that we have this big uh, purine in our small pyrimidine and the hydrogen bonds that are existing. And they just so happen to line up. So lovely. Now, what about cytosine and guanine? Well, here's another image. So here, just to show you, we have our adenine and thymine, just like what we have in this image. And over here, we have our uh, guanine and our cytosine. And we can see that there's actually three hydrogen bonds that exist between those because of how uh, the branches that we have coming off of our, our carbon rings and how everybody lines up. 
So that is how um, these base pairs come together, and that's why it is so specific. It has to do partly with real estate. You don't want to put two big clunky ones next to each other, so it makes more sense to put a larger one with a smaller one. And to make sure that the um, hydrogens are going to line up nicely and create those hydrogen bonds. Now our other ribonucleic acid is going to be um, ribonucleic acid. And ribonucleic acid's job is basically to produce proteins. It's involved in all the steps needed to actively produce protein. So what does that mean as far as its relationship to DNA? Well, one of the things that it's going to be doing with DNA is it's going to go read the recipe that is housed within the DNA. And, um, it, and in that way, it's going to be similar because it has to write down the recipe. So there's going to be part of the, the group of ribonucleic acids that are going to be responsible for reading and replicating sections of DNA. And then from there, um, it's going to take it outside of the nucleus and then do the replication process. So in some ways, RNA is going to be very similar to DNA, and in some ways, it's going to be very different. One of the ways that RNA is going to be very different from DNA is that it's going to be a single strand of nucleotides as opposed to a double strand. The other way that it's going to be different is that most of the activity of RNA is going to be outside of the nucleus. So when we think of, about DNA, DNA is in the domain of the nucleus. It, it does all of its replication and um, uh, twisting and untwisting and repair to processes, it all happens within the DNA. RNA only replicates the section of DNA that it uh, that has the instructions for the protein the body wants to make, and then it's going to go outside of the nucleus and finish the activity. Um, the sugar ring that is going to be making up um, RNA is actually going to be ribose. That's going to be the one that has the oxygen, which is different than DNA because that nucleotide is going to be absent of that oxygen on the second carbon in that carbon ring. Another difference that we see between DNA and RNA has to do with thymine. Um, of the four nucleotides, they're all going to be the same except for thymine. DNA uses thymine. RNA is going to use uracil. So we'll, we'll still see adenine in RNA, we'll still see guanine, we'll still see cytosine. But instead of thymine, we're going to not use thymine, and instead we're going to be using uracil. Now, why, why do we have this difference? Well, I've read about that, and it seems that the answer is that it's easier for the body to make uracil, which means that when it comes to replicating the, the DNA sequence in order to make protein, it's just very simple for the body to drop in a uracil. It's a streamlined process to produce it and drop it in, and it still achieves the same function that we see thymine doing as far as protein production goes. That's what I've read. So there you go. So let's say that we had a strand of DNA. It would look like this. If we replicated this exactly as an RNA, it would look like this. So wherever we had a thymine, we would now replace it with a uracil. Now, a moment ago, I said that there were a group of ribonucleic acids that are responsible for protein synthesis in the body, and here they're listed. We have, we have messenger RNA, we have transfer RNA, and we have ribosomal RNA. These are three different ribonucleic acid structures, and each one has a specific job when it comes to making protein. Now, we start off with messenger RNA, and it's the job of messenger RNA to go into the nucleus and find the part of the, the DNA that contains the recipe, and then to copy that recipe. So the primary function of messenger RNA is going to happen within the DNA. Now it's going to take that little recipe out, and when it does, it's going to have to find a ribosomal RNA, which is this one right here. Now it's, the, and it's going to present that to the ribosomal RNA. Now it's going to be the job of ribosomal RNA to actually assemble the amino acids into the protein. The other thing that ribosomal RNA is going to do is going to read that recipe, and then it's going to have to make sure that we have all the amino acids necessary 
in order to start the process. Now what it'll do, what ribosomal RNA will do, is it'll call up its buddy transfer RNA and it'll say this is the recipe, do we have the amino acids available? And transfer RNA will say yeah we sure do, let me bring them to you. So transfer RNA will transfer the amino acids to the ribosomal RNA and then the ribosomal RNA will continue to read messenger RNA and begin to assemble the protein based upon the recipe of the nucleic acids. So what do I mean? Let me give you an animation. So here we have a cell and here is our uh, nucleus and within the nucleus is going to be our DNA. Now we're going to have messenger RNA show up in the nucleus and it's going to read the portion of the DNA where we have the recipe for the protein that, we're going to, that we want to make. And messenger RNA is going to write that recipe down. And then it's going to look for one of these guys right here, a ribosomal RNA. So messenger RNA is then going to be bringing its recipe that it wrote down over to ribosomal RNA. And ribosomal RNA will read it. And it's going to call up transfer RNA and says, hey, do you have all of these amino acids? Because I want to make some protein. And transfer RNA says, I sure do. Let me bring them to you. So transfer RNA brings in the, the amino acids and drops them off. And then they all get, um, they, they start to be worked on by ribosomal RNA. And ribosomal RNA, while it reads the messenger RNA, will start to assemble these amino acids in the appropriate sequence and begin making a protein. That's how all that works. Now, the act of making protein isn't something that you necessarily have to know for this unit, but I feel like over teaching this section helps make the role of each one of these different ribosomal RNAs a little more tangible, and that's why I just did that. So that we understand how DNA and RNA are replicated, let's actually go through the exercise of doing that. So let's say that we had this little sequence of DNA right here, and uh, you're being asked to make a complementary strand of DNA. So the first thing you have to think about is what are going to be the base pairs. Well, in DNA, it's going to always be A and T and C and G. So on our complementary strand, the one up above, we're, all, we're going to have that sort of base pair coupling happening. So when we look at our first nucleotide right here, it's going to be an A, which means that what has to go here in this position is going to be a T. Right here we have a G, so what, we, what should go in this position? A C. Got it? So in our third position, we have a C. That means that our complementary um, nucleotide needs to be a G. And then we have a T, which means we need a, an A, right? And now we have a C, which means we need a G. And we have a G, and so in our complementary strand, we need a C. In our, it's called our, our parent strand. In our parent strand, we have a C, which means we need a G. In our parent strand we have a T which means in our complementary strand we need an A. In our parent strand we need, uh, we have an A which means we need a T. Parent has a G which means we need a C. Parent has an A which means we need a T. Parent has a T which means we need an A. So that's how we make a complementary strand of DNA. So if we were in the business of replicating DNA, like maybe we're about to do cell division, this is how we would need to make sure we create that complementary strand of DNA. Now, let's make some RNA. Okay, so let's make some messenger RNA. So where does messenger RNA get reproduced? It gets produced in the nucleus, right. Okay, so let's think about our base pairs with messenger RNA. So what are our complementary base pairs going to be? Well, they're going to be A and U, C and G. So wherever we see an A, in our RNA we're going to put a U. Now what if we see a T in our, in our uh, parent strand of DNA? Well, then we're going to use an A.
let's just do the exercise. Okay, so right off the bat, in our parent strand of DNA, we have an A. What does that mean we're going to put in our uh, messenger RNA? It means that we're going to put a U, because otherwise we'd have to put a T. But we don't use T in RNA, we use U. Okay, in our parent strand of DNA, we have a G, so it's pretty straightforward. We're, we're going to put a C in our uh, messenger RNA. We have a C in our parent strand. We're going to put a G in our RNA. Now, here in our parent strand, we have a T. What are we going to put in our RNA? We're going to put an A because we still use adenosine. We just don't use thymine. All right, so now our next um, base pair would be a C and a G. Parent strand has a G, we would put a C in our RNA. Parent strand has a C, we would use a G in our RNA. Parent strand has a T, what would we use in our RNA? We would use an A, right. Oh, parent strand has an A. What are we going to use in our messenger RNA? We're going to use a U, uracil. Otherwise, it would be a thymine. But we don't use thymine in RNA, we use uracil. Okay, parent strand has a G, that means we're going to use a C. Parent strand has an A, what are we going to use? We're going to use a, a uracil, that's right, a U. Parent strand has a T, we're going to finish off with an A. All right, so you're very likely going to have to be able to do this either on a quiz or an exam. So my recommendation is that if you're being asked to reproduce a complementary uh, DNA strand, that you write down what your base pairs are going to be. It's always going to be A and T, T and A, C and G, C, uh, G and C. If you're being asked to reproduce messenger RNA, it's going to be A, U, a in the parent strand, U on your RNA, T in the parent strand, A in the RNA, C, G, G, and C. All right, so write those down so you don't make that mistake. There's a couple of points. You can thank me later. So the last molecule we're going to talk about is ATP. This will be brief because we've already talked about ATP. So what do we know about it? Well, we know that the, it harnesses chemical energy. Um, once we break down glucose in the presence of oxygen, we basically do some rearranging of some other molecules and we create ATP as a result of that. And that when we break this bond between these two phosphates right here, that it, the, the energy that gets released is something that cells can use to drive cellular activities. Now, we also know that the structure of ATP, as the name implies, um, is that we're going to have this adenosine over here, plus three phosphates over here, and that it's going to be attached to a sugar ring, in this case, um, ribose. Now, like we said, if we, if we break the bond that we see right here, we're going to send this phosphate away. So if we do that, we're going to capture some energy, and then the cell gets to do some activity as a result of that. But what happens to that phosphate? Well, that phosphate can be transferred to any number of other molecules that can possibly accept it, and then the uh, um, those, those molecules will go on to have their own um, experience. So we actually use phosphate in buffering systems in the body. Phosphate is used to store calcium in the bone. So we use phosphate in a lot of different other ways in the body. So trust me, we do not use, we don't waste phosphate. Let's just put it like that. Now, at this point, our ATP becomes ADP, adenosine, uh, adenosine diphosphate, di meaning two. So we are now left with the molecule that has two phosphates. Now there's a couple of things that can happen here. We can uh, either put this structure through an enzymatic reaction and reattach the terminal phosphate and recreate ATP. The body's really good about doing that. So we recycle that phosphate that we sent packing um, and turn ADP back into ATP. Or if we needed to, we could actually uh, eliminate this second phosphate and create another molecule that can go on to be involved in a, a whole host of other chemical reactions in the body. So I introduced this concept at this point just to illustrate that 
there's very little wasted motion in the body. So it is possible that we could repopulate adenosine tri adenosine diphosphate with that third phosphate restoring ATP and then having this cycle go backwards and forwards and there are areas of the body where we see that happening or we could remove another phosphate and create this molecule which becomes biologically active and goes on to fuel other activities um, in the cell. So it really just depends on what the body needs. Mother Nature is very good like I said about not having any wasted motion um, and ATP is a really great example of that. Now you might look at this, I just want to put this out here as well, you might look at this and say well that looks an awful lot like a nucleotide. And indeed you will read, if you do enough reading, you'll read that there are authors that will call this a nucleotide. But I'm going to point out that right here we have adenosine which is different than adenine. We get uh, adenosine from adenine, but if we were going to make this a nucleotide, we would have to do a little bit of work on this molecule and recraft it back into um, adenine in order to make it a nucleotide, which could be uh, functional in DNA and RNA. So uh, just putting that out there. Just putting it out there. And with that, we're done with learning outcome 2.6.